Thank you all for having me um, give a presentation for y'all today um, on this subject. Um, and it's uh, actually quite relevant uh, to y'all's region um, as, the shrimping, as, the, as the shrimping industry in North Carolina really did uh, come out of um, Brunswick and New Hanover counties. Um, and so um, really the, the, actually, let me try and hide this real quick. Okay, so early on, uh, the shrimp industry in North Carolina um, came out of New Hanover County. Um, there are some mentions of, um, of shrimp nuts being used kind of in the, um, in the antebellum period, but not a whole lot. Um, but where you really do start to see a lot of discussion about shrimping is um, in the years following the Civil War, um, there's uh, shrimp sains um, being used around the inlets as well as cast nets and skim nets. Um, so it's kind of pull in um, fish around the inlets. Um, and it was being um, sold in the fish Thank markets you. in Wilmington. Uh, they're mm -hmm. using uh, mm -hmm. boiled and salted uh, shrimp were being sold in Wilmington as well as taxed. Um, and slowly the, the industry kind of spread out from the Wilmington markets into the, the neighboring communities. I'm not trying to um, but unfortunately, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of room for growth early on within the shrimping industry in North Carolina uh, because there wasn't enough um, ice for refrigeration. Um, there's issues with uh, transportation, uh, getting the shrimp to the market. Um, and also, and this is just gonna be a problem going well into the future, is that just most North Carolinians weren't accustomed to seafood, particularly, particularly shrimp. Shrimp in North Carolina for the longest time were known as, were called bugs. They um, were, were known as being this undesirable um, sea creature that just fouled up and tore up people's nets. And, and there really wasn't um, much need for them opposed for use as fertilizer. Um, you also had problems with um, inefficient gear. Um, a lot of these nets uh, weren't specifically purpose, purposely designed to catch shrimp. Uh, they, they modified these nets by making the, the mesh um, on these nets um, just smaller and smaller uh, to catch. And also, um, there, most people didn't have wide access to uh, motorized watercraft. So they couldn't follow the shrimp around um, the water. They, they had to hang out in spots that were um, heavily influenced by tides. So creeks, uh, mouths of creeks and rivers and inlets uh, where the shrimp were just going to be um, kind of pulled in and out um, by the tides. Here's um, basically um, sort of the, the areas where you really kind of see the industry crop up um, early on uh, through the Southport area, the Shalote area, um, Masonboro Inlet, and and of course, Wilmington being where a lot of it's being marketed. Um, as I mentioned, um, they're using uh, these shrimp sains, which are basically these whole sains that are very similar to what people were catching mullet in, but just much finer mesh. Um, the ability, uh, so motorized watercraft um, in North Carolina really came um, it became more widespread um, in the early 1900s when th there's greater availability of these naphtha um, motors, which are early oil um, powered motors, really um, low horsepower. Um, 1911, you start to get sufficient um, transportation to Southport with a railway. Um, and most importantly, um, by 1914, you have the introduction of the otter trawl to North Carolina. Um, and so I'm going to jump in and give you an explanation, a short explanation of the otter trawl. So um, it's net that's dragged underwater behind a boat, and you have these wooden boards um, that are underwater as well that are keeping the mouth of the net open. It was originally developed in the UK and was used um, 
as, as sort of a beam trawl um, fishery to, to catch um, fish in the North Atlantic. And um, it was used by steamers in the UK um, in the 1890s. And then it was transferred um, to the United States by the Bay State Fishing Company, uh, which I believe is out of Massachusetts in around 1905. And then um, it filtered down the coast of the United States um, as other um, fishermen saw this technology being used and saw how efficient it was at catch catching fish. Um, you know, it was readily adopted. And then um, you had um, immigrants who were moving down the coast, these sort of transient fishermen um, bring this technology and they introduce it uh, to Southport. And uh, you have Scandinavian immigrants um, who introduce it to Southport. Um, so you have uh, Samuel Thompson, who was a uh, Norwegian immigrant who, when he originally came to the United States, uh, he was employed in the pound net fisheries of uh, New Jersey. Um, and then you have Otto Benson, who was a Swedish immigrant and he was the father-in-law um, of, of Thompson. And um, he was also employed in the pound net fisheries of New Jersey. And um, they moved to Southport between 1910 and 1914 not exactly sure specifically when. Um, one of the earliest bits of documentation that I saw for their residence in Southport was sort of tragically um, Thompson's uh, wife um, gave birth to a stillborn child, uh, tragically. Um, but the, the two men, um, Thompson and Benson, um, were employed in the uh, steak net or gill net fisheries um, out of Southport and uh, George, Town, uh, South Carolina. And um, right here we have one of the earliest references, uh, possible references to an otter trawl in North Carolina. A new industry for Southport is shrimp catching. The shrimp are caught out of the ocean. Two local fishermen have perfected a net with which they are able to catch 15 or 20 bushels a day. And um, Prior to this, um, you know, shrimping was really um, more of an inshore fishery, you know, around the sounds and rivers, mountains, and creeks. The otter trawl allowed them to finally go out into the ocean in boats, in motorized boats. Um, so Thompson and Benson were quickly joined by other Scandinavian immigrants who lived in Southport. Uh, you had Jonas Matson and Chris Danielson joined in with their operations. Um, and then quickly you see um, the, the prices of, of shrimp um, being advertised in the area and it's going for quite a bit of money. Um, you know, a dollar ten, dollar thirty five per bushel doesn't sound like much today, but um, in today's money, that's about thirty to thirty six dollars uh, per bushel, which um, was, was good money for them. The boats are making about $20 a day or, or about $547 in today's money. Um, and what they're using, interestingly, are they're using the large version of the Seabright skiff. Um, when a lot of people think of Seabright skiffs, they're thinking of these small um, wooden boats. But um, there was a big version of the Seabright that was used in the New Jersey pound net fishery. And so these, these Scandinavian immigrants that have experience in the pound net fishery of New Jersey are bringing down the boats that they're using uh, to this area as well, um, employing them uh, to, pull, to pull otter trawls. Um, and then you quickly, in 1915, you have a shrimp cannery that's opened up the, the Dozier and St. George um, shrimp cannery. It is not actually the first shrimp cannery um, in Southport. Uh, you had one pop up in 1890 that was also um, canning clams and oysters and other seafood um, as well. Um, but that one wasn't in business beyond 1900. But this one is sort of the first real successful specific shrimp cannery and um, that did a large business employed lots of people um, and 
was also procuring shrimp from Florida and Georgia uh, to can. And you had Charles Gauss, um, which let me get my laser pointer at. This fellow right here. And if you um, were, if you were available for my last talk, we talked about Charles a lot in terms of Southport's Menhaden industry, but he's also heavily involved in the shrimp industry and moving forward in the future, he would also be heavily involved in other uh, shrimping ventures. Um, Chalot got its first cannery in 1915, um, it was built and owned um, by a man from Massachusetts. Um, and then finally, in 1915, the state of North Carolina starts to regulate shrimp trawling in southern North Carolina, specifically Brunswick, New Hanover, and Pender counties. And then um, you quickly have all these sort of debates and controversies surrounding uh, the shrimping industry and, and bycatch. Um, you have these mullet fishermen who are claiming that these 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 otter trolls are taking all the young mullet and killing them and that's why you know these mullet fishermen aren't able to catch more um with their beach sands um but the, the sort of debate plays out in public and sort of what people decide the problem was were these old sort of shrimp hull sands that people are using at sort of the mouths of rivers and inlets um, that are really causing the real problem that maybe the otter trawl um, isn't quite the problem that people thought it was. And to be fair, these the, the mullet fishermen were also claiming um, that the Menhaden industry with their purse sands um, were destroying uh, the mullet fishery as well. And there's actually better evidence to support that because um, when the mullet, when Menhaden weren't running, uh, a lot of these um, Menhaden factories would go out and use their purse sands to catch sea mullet and then sell them uh, the, the mullet to uh, seafood dealers um, on shore. And then unfortunately, Samuel Thompson uh, died in 1916. Uh, so, you know, he, he introduced the otter troll around 1914 and then two years later, he's dead, um, tragically. Um, and his family, actually, I'll go back to that slide. His, his family didn't stay in Southport. Um, his family actually moved to St. Mary's, Georgia, and his father-in-law continued um, in the industry, and really his family sort of expanded and, and flourished um, in Georgia. Uh, so Southport really did um, lose them. Um, but his influence lived on, um, and there, around the time he died, there's also a slump in Brunswick County's uh, shrimp industry. And so a lot of these fishermen uh, from Southport and, and elsewhere in Brunswick County started migrating south and they started going to St. Mary's, Georgia and Fernandina Beach, Florida. And these places are actually where the modern shrimp industry in the United States actually arose. Um, and this is you know, a satellite photo of, of what those communities look like today. Um, th they're separated by the St. Mary's River um, that cuts across the, the Florida border. Um, and so um, in, in the late teens and, and through the 20s um, in Southport, you see this just explosion um, of productivity within the shrimp industry. Um, you have more canneries that open up lots of fresh seafood dealers um, open up and specialize in shrimp. Um, you've got Florida fishermen. So you've got Southport fishermen that are going down south um, to, to chase shrimp. And then you also have Florida fishermen are also coming to Southport as well, chasing after shrimp. Um, and you start to get over a hundred boats start operating all of a sudden now Southport. Um, and then there's hundreds and hundreds of jobs you know, apart from, um, you know, catching shrimp, there's tons of jobs for processing, um, distributing and selling shrimp. Um, and one of the, the really important families 
uh, that comes to Southport are the, the is the Fodell family, and um, I believe there's actually a road in Southport named Fodell, and and that's what this comes from. It's actually a family of Italian immigrants that had settled in Fernandina uh, Beach, Florida, um, and had been um, really sort of instrumental in that community. And their business had expanded so much that they decided to um, expand into Southport. Um, and they had set up the Universal Fish and Prawn Company um, in Southport. Um, they purchased the docks that were formerly being used by um, the side paddle wheel steamer Wilmington. You might have seen uh, the Wilmington featured in um, old postcards um, from the area, a uh, huge facility, and they had their own fleet of boats. Uh, they had 20 boats that are operating out of Southport. Um, also in the 1920s, you have an ice plant is established for the first time. Um, specifically because the seafood industry is growing so rapidly, um, the Southport Supply Company was behind the um, creation um, of this ice plant. Um, and um, they just got to the point where the, the, the industry could no longer rely on ice being brought down from Wilmington. They, they had to have their own local source that they could create and sell to the, the fish houses. Um, then you have World War I and uh, things, the situation kind of changes. Um, the US Food and, uh, Administration uh, really promotes seafood. There's a lot of propaganda posters that are created um, where they're trying to get Americans to consume um, seafood and um, have things like poultry and beef and pork being produced and shipped overseas uh, to support the troops. Um, and you actually have one of the local seafood dealers has an ad where he, it says, Mr. Hoover says, eat fish and oysters. I have them. I have shrimp too. He's emphasizing the shrimp, but Mr. Hoover didn't know that. He's a bright young man and I like him and think the people should take his advice. Um, of course, he would say that. It's good for his business. And then uh, in October 1929, you, famously you have the stock market crash. Um, which really does a number on the shrimp industry. Uh, so you have the demand and value of seafood uh, plummeted. And then, uh, but people, the fishermen didn't quit, um, you know, shrimping. And so your, your market gets glutted with shrimp, which also causes the price to continually become depressed. So, you know, there's too much uh, shrimp on the market. Um, and so during the sort of depression uh, years, um, you know, shrimp is going for only three or four cents per pound, um, which is, you know, basically around 50 or 60 cents um, in today's money. Um, and during the depression era in North Carolina, you have something very in interesting develops. You have a federally funded fishermen's cooperative um, that starts up called the North Carolina Fisheries Incorporated. Um, you had basically what happened was the state of North Carolina uh, went and represents testified before Congress asking for help, um, financial help, keeping to keep the, um, the seafood industry alive in Eastern North Carolina. And they presented this idea of a co-op um, there had, there was only one other fisherman's co-op in the United States at that time, and it was one up in Maine. And so they wanted to pattern uh, this organization over the, after the co-op in Maine. And so uh, Congress decides to fund the project and the funds are then given to the state of North Carolina and then the state of North Carolina helps set up this co-op and then disperse the funds uh, to the co-op. Uh, the idea was that the co-op was going to be self-supporting, that it was going to be based out of Moorhead City, and it was going to have branches in Southport, Belhaven, and Manio. Um, it started out working okay, um, but then it quickly fell apart, unfortunately. Um, but one of, the, one of the main ideas behind the organization was how to manage the seafood gluts. Um, they're going to use co cold storage facilities. Um, they established a quick freeze plant in Moorhead City. Um, and then um, 
and there's also a cold storage plant, uh, although not a quick freeze plant um, in Southport. Um, and they're also gonna try and you know, market the seafood um, to citizens of North Carolina, break into the interior markets in places like Raleigh and Winston-Salem, Charlotte, um, et cetera. Um, and it, it doesn't work out because the North Carolinian they haven't developed a taste for seafood yet. There, there isn't sort of a domestic demand for it is one of the problems they had. And uh, there's just these constant financial problems that kept, that prevented the Southport um, branch from operating on a, on a consistent basis. Things got so bad that the Bellhaven and Mania um, branches closed down completely. Um, and in the end, uh, the Morehead City one's the only one that survived. Um, but there is also some exciting developments that happened during the 1930s with the shrimp industry. Um, Carter County became a significant player in the industry. Um, and, uh, you know, the industry spread to Cor Sound and to the Cape Lookout area. Um, and from there, it spread into Pamlico Sound. Um, and then you had all these Carter County fishermen and fish dealers. Um, they started coming down to Southport and operating. And so you had these close ties um, between uh, Moorhead City, Beaufort, and, and Southport. Um, and uh, one of the things, you, you had this massive hurricane that hit the North Carolina coast in 1933 and cut Barden's Inlet. Um, this is Shackleford Banks right here, and this is the bite at Cape Lookout. Um, Shackleford Banks and Cape Lookout, or you know, they, they used to be one, they used to be connected right here. There's a like little creek that went through there, uh, but the hurricane blew it out. Uh, this allowed more salt water to get into Core Sound and uh, greater tidal flow, and it became just a great environment for shrimp to develop. Um, and also you have channel nutting, which is very unique to Carter County. You don't see it outside of Carter County, uh, emerges um, from this development. And really you see um, th these channel yet that's being heavily used around Barton Inlet uh, and Bogue Sound um, and the Back Sound areas. And it's, it's kind of like an otter trawl that's staked into place and anchored into place. And it relies on the flows of current and people in small skiffs um, tend to operate them. Um, but anyways, that was just a kind of interesting unique thing to, to throw into the presentation. Um, but probably more significant is that you also have the core sounder, which is a, a specific boat type that's featured here in this photo, is developed in Carter County in the 1930s. And it's a very important boat in North Carolina um, uh, commercial fishing history because it's an, ex it's an extremely versatile boat that can be used in both offshore and inshore fisheries. And you can change the rig um, on the boat very easily to accommodate various um, uh, modes of, of fishing, including shrimping. Um, and it actually becomes one of the dominant boat types um, in Southport because you have all these people from Carter County they are getting into shrimping, they're bringing their boat types on down uh, to Southport. And um, this is a photo from Southport um, and you look at a lot of photos from 1930s Southport and you see core sounders everywhere. Um, and you get to the point where at, um, at the height of, um, of shrimping in 1930s in the area, there's 150 to 200 shrimp trawlers that are operating out of uh, Southport alone. Um, and here I have listed some of the top shrimp dealers um, in Southport and they all had their own fleets. Um, you know, and I, notably, you have Louis J. Hardy um, and the, the Photo brothers who are probably a couple of the, the most important um, firms um, operating out of Southport at the time. Um, Louis J. Hardy, he's um, another one of these individuals who's originally coming out of Fernandina Beach. Uh, he moved to Southport in 1934. He had the Colonial Shrimp Company, but he also, throughout his time in Southport, had other shrimp companies as well. Um, he, he built up a sizable fleet of shrimp boats, and 
in the late 30s, um, he started pioneering this movement between Southport and Louisiana. Um, and the reason he did this is because there are these scientific studies in the Gulf of Mexico where scientists were locating where there's um, high densities of shrimp. And so he was one of these individuals who's leading um, Brunswick County fishermen into going after um, these uh, shrimp um, and, and really trying to be sort of profitable while the North Carolina industry is uh, kind of languishing at the time. And, and you know, towards the, end, towards the end of the 30s, the price starts to come up, things start to get better. Um, but before I, I go too much further, um, I haven't touched on processing and I feel like I need to. Um, so apart from just catching the shrimp, you know, it's, it's landed and then you have all these people that have to, to get it ready to go to market. So, um, uh, you know, all the, the shrimp is collected on the boats, put in these ba metal baskets and then taken inside these fish houses, dumped on these tables. And then you have all these pickers who are primarily, you know, African-American are, they're heading these shrimp and they're putting the shrimp into these galvanized buckets and they're given a nickel for every um, gallon bucket of shrimp that they produce. Um, and, you know, it's from there, it's washed and graded and it's deveined and then packed on ice and, and shipped out to markets, primarily Northern markets. And so I have these photos here that, that show the process, these guys with these big um, baskets of shrimp, taking them off the boats and moving them into the fish house, dumping them out. And then you have all these ladies who are working hard uh, to head the shrimp. And they, apparently they, they said that there's so much, there, that the banks in Southport had to carry um, an unusually high number of nickels um, because simply because of the shrimp industry and how many nickels were being distributed uh, by these fish houses. Um, and, you know, someone who's very proficient um, at picking shrimp could make about $2 um, in just a, a few hours. So in that photo, the, the guy is getting ready to give uh, that picker some a nickel and then you've got these gentlemen uh, you know packing uh, ice and shrimp together um, in wooden boxes um, and so yeah um, so six cents per pound so things still the market's still not great by the late 1930s um, and in October 1938, the fishermen in Southport go on strike. Um, they want to make a dollar fifty per bushel, um, but they're all at the time they're only getting paid a dollar. And um, so the the fish dealers were trying to explain to the fishermen that well, if we we give you a, a dollar per bushel, we're going to take a loss. Um, and so you, you have one of these local reverends. Uh, Reverend Marshall uh, wound up mediating the dispute and they compromised at a dollar twenty-five per bushel. And there's actually going forward in Southport's um, uh, shrimp um, and, and Menhaden Industries, there's a, a lot of union activity, a lot of strikes. Uh, well, not a lot, but a, a quite quite a bit um, of, of this sort of organizing labor. Um, 39, there's a controversy with the otter trawl. Um, again, it's there's, there's these concerns with bycatch. They're trying to regulate uh, the mesh of these things so they're not catching fish that are too small um, by accident. And they're uh, limiting shrimping um, in Brunswick County. You couldn't shrimp within three miles of an inlet. And at the time, there were seven inlets. Um, and so we have a, a map from this period that I've, you know, indicated with these red arrows where all the inlets uh, were. Uh, 
And as I mentioned earlier, um, by the late 1930s, you get this migration of, uh, of Brunswick County uh, shrimpers moving to Morgan City, Louisiana, and Fernandina Beach, Florida, uh, so to try and find uh, better shrimping areas, try and make more money um, during the, the slumps in North Carolina. And that's just showing you all where uh, those communities are located. Yeah, yeah, soft is up in this area. Um, and so by the time 1940s rolled around, the industry is in recovery, price of shrimp is going up. Also, there's plenty of shrimp to go around in terms of catch. Um, and there's a lot of people employed um, in Brunswick County um, in the industry all as well. And then of course, World War II happens um, and just completely changes the situation and you don't get a situation similar uh, to World War I where uh, the, the country is really pushing seafood. Again, the, well, the country is pushing seafood, but unfortunately they're putting price caps um, on shrimp um, and they're discounting it and there's labor shortages because um, you know the the fishermen's wages have tripled because a lot of the the people who would normally go shrimping they've either gone off to war or they've gone up to work um, in Wilmington at the shipbuilding um, factory where they can make more money and also the pickers are a lot of them are in the same situation so their pay is tripling um, the price of just materials so like boxes the price of the boxes of ship your shrimp is doubled. Uh, the shipping prices have gone up due to costs of fuel. Um, the replacement parts are just difficult to get for, especially for, for engines and winches um, that are used on these vessels. Um, and some boats are even commandeered um, by the military. And, and I actually recently saw um, a photo of um, shrimp boats from Southport that had been commandeered and uh, they had um, US Naval vessel um, numbers painted on, on their hulls. Um, also during World War II, you have this big child labor dispute that breaks out because um, you've got these shrimp packers in Southport that because they can't get enough, you know, men and women to work in the industry, they start using children. Um, to, to fill those gaps, um, particularly the Fodell family um, gets in trouble with, with the federal government over this. Um, and, um, but, also, but at the same time, they're getting in trouble, but they start pushing back at the government and they start to negotiate with the government um, because you know there isn't enough people to work, but this industry needs to continue um, if all these uh, th these dealers are to stay in business. And so the federal government agrees to a compromise where they're going to agree to relax rules a little bit, allow teenagers from the ages 14 to 16 to go work um, picking shrimp, um, but they could only work six days a week and they had limited hours and they had to go to school and, you know, they just... Um, you know, they, they couldn't be employed um, as regularly as adults. And I actually read um, this one account um, from a guy who was employed in child labor. And he claimed he didn't have any problem with it. He said he actually quite enjoyed doing it because it gave him pocket money to go buy candy and go to the movie theater. Um, so uh, for him, it, it really wasn't a, a big deal. Um, and so then you have the, the post-World War II eras, then those are the boom years, the sort of the years from 1945 to 1955. You have the largest shrimp landings on record for the state of North Carolina take place during this period. Um, you have some of the biggest, or, or you get bigger trawlers um, with large diesel engines being produced. Um, some people are actually buying um, surplus Coast Guard vessels and converting them into shrimp trawlers. Um, and also, Americans by this time have developed a taste for shrimp because during World War II, the United States did not ration seafood 
Um, they rationed pork and poultry and beef, um, but they didn't put any limits on how much seafood that you could purchase. And so I've got this graph here that illustrates um, the landings in North Carolina from 1918 to 1955. Where there are gaps, those are the years where the state did not record shrimp landings for whatever reason. Um, you, the state didn't really start consistently recording um, seafood landings until uh, really around the 1920s. Um, but for some reason, shrimp wasn't as consistent as, as other species. Um, and also you really, the, the, the big Florida style trawlers really take off by this time period. They had been present in Southport before due to the Florida and Louisiana influences in Southport. But after World War II, um, you've got all these fishermen um, from uh, Southport start to in invest in those vessels. Um, during World War II, you did have some of these large Florida style vessels produced in North Carolina, but they're produced in Washington, North Carolina, and they're being built for companies operating out of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but um, you, you had, um, interestingly, you had Lewis Hardy um, and after World War II employed a man by the name of Lewis Spalding. Uh, he's an African-American boat builder who was fr originally from Fernandina Beach, Florida. And he had learned how to build these Florida style shrimp trawlers from a Greek boat builder um, uh, uh, by the name of Clonaris. And um, he, uh, Spalding had moved with Clonaris to Morgan City, Louisiana in the 1930s um, when, when he moved his shipyard, his boatyard um, from, from Florida to Louisiana. Um, and, and, and Hardy hired this guy and brought him up um, to Southport to build him a new uh, fleet of large shrimp trawlers. And um, Lewis Spalding also taught a bunch of the local African-Americans in Southport how to build these boats. Um, and, and this is just an ad from the Clenar shipyard in uh, Louisiana uh, where he had worked. And this is actually uh, uh, the area uh, where they were building Lewis Hardy's boats um, in the late 40s. Their boat shed. And then this is a group of African American boat builders um, building one of these large trawlers. And um, for all I know, Lewis Balding could be in this photo, but I don't know uh, the names of, of the men in this particular photograph. Um, you also had famously uh, Craig Arnold. Um, from Southport, um, this famous uh, legless uh, shrimp boat and, and just regular um, boat builder. Um, he also shrimped on the side as well. Um, he was born with this congenital disease that affected the bones in his legs. And at, at a young age, he had to have both his legs amputated, but he didn't let that hold him back in life. Uh, he, he worked on shrimp boats and he built shrimp boats and he took people out sport fishing in the off season. Um, and, uh, and he built some of the big uh, shrimp trawlers to come out of Southport. Um, and, um, and it should be noted that other people, um, you, Southport and Brunswick County fishermen, they're going down to Florida and they're buying shrimp trawlers down there and bringing them back to Southport. And then you, you've got all these people that are, that are forming the basis for this sort of Florida style shrimp trawlers and the people in Southport and Brunswick County are taking on those designs and building them elsewhere in the county. So out towards Varnum Town, um, you know, Holden Beach area, there's a lot of uh, shrimp trawlers that are being built out there and their whole designs are, are somewhat different. Um, uh, a lot of the traditional designs incorporate a, uh, a rounded hull, but in Brunswick County, uh, most of the shrimp trawlers that were being produced um, by local boat builders are using a, a V bottom or a dead rise um, style. Um, but you also have 
uh, large trawler construction taking place in Carteret County. You have uh, the Moorhead City Shipbuilding Corporation, which was mass produced, which, which this is the photo from, from that company. Um, and they were mass producing large shrimp trawlers. Uh, their trawlers were getting up into the 80 foot, 70, 80 foot range. You also have the Willis Brothers of Williston, uh, the Gilligan Brothers of Harker's Island, the Rose Brothers of Harker's Island, and uh, Willis and Son um, from the Marshallburg area. So the, a, a lot of these boat trawlers are also being built down in uh, what are known as the Core Sound communities. Um, also, Pamlico Sound becomes a huge area for shrimping um, in the late 1940s. Um, just, you know, 500 shrimp boats on the Pamlico Sound. Um, you had boats coming from Southport fishing the Pamlico. You had boats coming all the way from Florida to fish the Pamlico. Um, prices were good, um, it, which gave an economic boon to the communities of Pamlico Sound where the shrimp were being landed. Um, and there are all kinds of just development that's taking place, but I've also got this graph to show you um, that Carter County um, eventually overtook uh, Brunswick County when it came to shrimp landings. Um, and this happened really, it started to happen, you know, in the late 30s, but it really happened in, in the late 40s and in the 50s and going forward. And there's some factors uh, to take into consideration with that. Um, so one of the big ones is that Carter County has access not only to the Atlantic Ocean, but there's also a large inshore um, fishery as well with uh, Bogue Sound uh, and Core Sound um, as being important ones for shrimping, but also you have Pamlico Sound as well, which was very profitable. Um, also, you have uh, shrimping takes off um, in the Florida Keys area and a lot of North Carolinians um, and, and the shrimpers from Southport, um, Brunswick County are really pioneering this is going down to the Dry Tortugas uh, in 1950. Um, and so uh, the Dry Tortugas, this at the very end, sort of the, the Florida Keys, um, and it's a national park. Um, Reserve today. It's, it's mostly just these really shallow reefs, but they were just full of, of shrimp at the time. Um, and people from Brunswick County, Carter County, um, all the way up through Pamlico Sound, where the fishermen were headed down to this area. Um, also, 1951, due to scientific studies, um, they discovered that there's a species of shrimp that was only active at night in the Pamlico Sound. Um, and so the state decided to open up um, night trawling um, in the Pamlico, uh, which, you know, just further caused, uh, you know, production to increase. Um, but also, you also, things are going really well economically in the late 40s and early 50s, but not all as well. Um, you've got a lot of the fishermen um, in Southport aren't happy and they go on strike um, and they accuse the dealers of underpaying them. And this strike causes 200 boats not to go out um, to go shrimp. And uh, the International Longshoremen's Association uh, gets involved um, and they sort of mediate the dispute. Um, and the, you even have to keep the strike going you have people from um, these, these union chapters um, elsewhere in the United States, they're sending money and food uh, to the families to kind of prolong um, this strike. Um, but there's also these strikes um, and uh, expand out into um, Pamlico County as well um, because there's accusations of price fixing and state and federal authorities uh, get involved in investigating those claims. Um, then you have Hurricane Hazel happens in 1954, which absolutely devastates the commercial fishing industry of Southport. Um, a lot of the fish houses were completely obliterated. Um, 
many of them were never rebuilt. Um, and you had all these trawlers that were washed up into people's backyards um, and ruined. And it was, it was a real, uh, it was a real mess. And there's the flooding in Southport. Um, and so you have the, the devastation of the of Hurricane Hazel, um, followed by really some difficult times with the industry from 1956 to 1961. Um, you see North Carolina shrimp landings plummet. Um, and then also the value of shrimp plummets as well in North Carolina. And um, it, it's largely environmental. Um, in, the, in, in the 50s, you have uh, too much rain um, in, in the winter and spring. Um, and also you had some heavy freezes that killed off um, juvenile shrimp and prevented them from ever developing and ever um, growing into mature adult shrimp. Um, and uh, so, there was just years where there's hardly any shrimp being produced. Um, also in North Carolina, in response to these decreased landings, um, increased the regulations on the industry. Uh, they imposed limits on night trawling <clears throat> and they banned um, trawling on Saturdays and Sundays um, and just became more aggressive with their enforcement. Uh, they started using aircraft uh, um, in addition to boats to help um, enforce these laws. Um, on top of that, Florida um, increased their restrictions as well um, because they are worried about overfishing um, in the Dry Tortugas area as well as elsewhere in the Florida Keys. Um, and uh, North Carolina shrimpers uh, continued to, to go down there shrimp and in violation of those laws and quite a few of them were thrown into jail because of it. Um, South Carolina also imposed restrictions. Um, so shrimping in North Carolina was poor and it was difficult to go shrimp elsewhere um, outside of North Carolina. Um, so, so business was tough all around. Um, on top of that, you have imported shrimp coming into the United States um, at a rapidly growing rate. In 1915, you had 18 countries importing shrimp into the United States. By 1960, there are 51. And the bulk of it's coming out of Mexico and Southeast Asia. Um, and also, you have quick freezing technology is widespread throughout the United States at this time. So there's a large, uh, there's large amounts of frozen shrimp that are just sitting around waiting to go to the market, which is further depressing the price of shrimp in the United States. Um, so here we have um, show, a graph showing um, the, the rise of imports um, uh, of shrimp into the United States. And then um, here's uh, shrimp landings uh, versus imported shrimp. Um, so you see that the imported shrimp um, is quickly catching up uh, to the domestic landings. Um, at the same time, um, you know, the shrimpers are, are suffering, um, you know, they, they, they can't make um, any money. And so, um, so shrimpers aren't going out and buying new boats and that's hurting the boat building industry as well. And so um, they, they cut taxes on shrimp boats. Um, uh, to help out with that. And the federal government also starts providing uh, loans to encourage um, the, the production of shrimp boats to keep the boat building industry going. Um, and, uh, and that's really also because the private banks um, are, are getting out of the, the business because so many people are defaulting on their loans. Um, and then you've got um, this, this movement um, to try and restrict, place restrictions on imported shrimp. And Representative Alton Lennon, who actually represented, he, he represented Brunswick County, or 
that was part of his his area uh, that he represented. Um, he fought to impose a quota, um, and um, he he wanted to impose a five million pounds per historically importing country. So all the the countries that are more recently getting into importing shrimp, he wanted to exclude those, and he really just wanted to kind of stick to the having imports coming out of like um, Central America. Um, and he also wanted to impose duties, um, increased duties on shrimp um, imports um, above that quota. Um, but this, this quota system, um, it completely failed um, due to largely um, both demand and um, foreign policy. Um, so US production was unable to meet US demand. Um, that was just a fact that necessitated imported shrimp, but also um, foreign policy dictated that we had to import shrimp because we were in the process of rebuilding the commercial fishing industry, industries of, of so many different countries after World War II, particularly in Southeast Asia, um, where we just obliterated um, those, uh, those, the, those um, fishing fleets. Um, and also these foreign governments we're also lobbying um, against these quotas and tariffs. Um, a really good example is, is Mexico did not want any restrictions because um, you had a lot of US shrimp boats operating in Gulf of Mexico going into uh, Mexican territorial waters. And for the longest time, Mexico didn't have any problem with that, but they threatened um, to start chasing these vessels out of their waters. Um, and, attempting to impose taxes on them and regulations. Um, and then on top of all this, you know, you have an increase to minimum wage for shrimp processors. Um, you know, by law, um, the minimum was, uh, uh, was, uh, was raised to a dollar per hour, um, but the price of seafood did go up. Um, and the also the shrimp industry was suffering in North Carolina. Um, on top of all that, you had sport fishing uh, was and, and shrimping was coming into conflict with each other uh, over controversies of bycatch. You know, the sport fishermen said that these otter trawls are destroying all the smaller fish. They're they're upsetting. Um, you know, the ecological systems um, and um, they, they wanted to, to place further bans on trawling in the Pamlico Sound and, and they wanted to have a three mile limit um, offshore where, you know, only trawling could only operate three miles offshore. Um, and uh, the, the state said, well, we'll sort of explore all these things. We'll study it scientifically. Um, uh, but we're not going to make any decisions, you know, until, um, until we get those studies in. And um, the, there is the sport fishermen even wanted to move the Division of Marine Fisheries uh, from Moorhead City to Raleigh. Um, so the commercial fishing industry wouldn't be able to influence the division as much. And that the sport fishing industry would be able to influence it more. Um, but here's a, a graph of the of North Carolina shrimp landings from the 50s to 1972. And as you can see, um, things really fall off and continue to stay at a, a much lower level. Um, and, uh, and, and things never, the industry has really never come back to where it was in, in the late 40s and the early 1950s. And um, that's where I'm kind of going to leave this presentation because a lot of my research for the the shrimping industry in North Carolina really only goes up uh, to 1965. Questions for, for David. You might want to unmute yourselves. It was a great presentation. Yeah, thank you. My great grandfather was Charles Goss that yeah. you referred to in the picture. Um, and he, they had the, what was it? The Ocean Seafood and Canning Company. Yeah, yeah, there's that one um, he was involved in. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned, he's he a business partner. Um, 
with, with the Dozier cannery. Right. Mm -hmm. He's involved in that. Um, yeah, Dr. Dozier was also involved in that with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that cannery burned down. And there's other people from the Menhaden industry mm -hmm. that were also heavily involved um, in the shrimp industry. Um, you had uh, James Church Jr. owned a shrimp cannery for a while that went out of business during the Great Depression. Um, My grandmother used to tell a story about when um, her, it was my great grandfather, when he had the Southport Shrimp Fish and Oil Company or whatever it was called, yeah. um, that they used to take the nets. He told them to drag the nets out in the river and they, they pulled in a whole lot of shrimp from there without having to go out into the ocean. Yeah, yeah. Um, kind of like they did, you know, in the, the 19th and early 20th centuries before mm -hmm. they started using the otter trawls. Okay, David. <clears throat> As uh, Catherine said, a great presentation. Really, really yeah. appreciate it. Okay. And, yeah, well, uh, thank you again for having me. Okay. So what's next? For me? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Just keep plugging along with all this commercial fishing mm -hmm. research. Um, and then uh, I guess one of the big things you want to do is I'm supposed to have a exhibit for the Southport Maritime Museum that keeps getting delayed by other projects, but hopefully I'll get that one. Mm -hmm. uh, done have you soon. ever spoken with Jimmy Moore? His father was Merritt Moore, and they had the um, the shrimp fleet along with Dallas Pickett and Lewis Hardy all down. Uh, no, I haven't talked to him. Um, I, I am familiar with the Piggotts and uh, and their relationship with the Hardys. Um, but Merritt Moore was another one. The three of them were big shrimpers. This was in the 50s, 60s, and they yeah. had the shrimp houses and such down at the yacht basin. Okay. Is he, is he still in the area? He, he is. He, because like most of the families, they migrated south during the right. week where they would go down to Florida. But he's, he has a place um, on Oak Island. He's still around. Okay. But maybe not year round. I'm not sure, but I'm sure somebody can find him for you. He would be a good resource. Yeah, I'm. I'm also trying to open up more of the, you know, that Varnum Town, Shalot, mm -hmm. kind of Holden Beach area story, because it's one that's not as readily known because it's more rural. Um, but um, a bulk, oh, the bulk of the fishermen. And boat builders for coming out of those communities. Again, thanks, thanks, David. We'll, we'll yeah. keep, keep in touch. I'd just like to go quickly over. Uh, we have three three upcoming events in in February. Well, um, and the first one is the Black History Symposium. That's going to be uh, Friday, February seventeenth, Saturday the eighteenth, and 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 on Sunday the nineteenth. On the seventeenth, Carolyn. Evans, who has uh, performed at the Black History Symposium before, will be portraying uh, Sojourner Truth. And um, Saturday, we have uh, John, one John, John Mosley. Say hello, John. John, John is going to be giving a, a presentation on, on Saturday. And then on Sunday will be the ever, ever popular and rightly so uh, gospel gospel fest on Sunday afternoon. So that's the Black History Symposium. Um, the Society's annual meeting is on February 20, 23rd, at, be at uh, 6.30 in the evening. Both the symposium and the annual meeting are in the community building. And then on the next Tuesday, second Tuesday talk will be March 14th, and the history and operation of the uh, Brunswick County Old Jail Museum. And Rich, Rich Sullivan, who's kind of the, the coordinator of, uh, of the Old Jail will be doing, doing that presentation. And I, I think you'll, you'll find it uh, uh, <clears throat> informative and, and also you're gonna, gonna have some fun as Rich tries to uh, convince you that Bonnie and Clyde were once in the, uh, 
in the old jail. Uh, don't let them get away with it. Okay, thanks so thanks so much for everybody who uh, came into the the Zoom presentation. Appreciate it much.